Hey, Danny. Hey, Professor. How's it going? Uh, it's really chilly today. Uh, I know. I love it. Uh, how are, it looks like you're at home today. Yeah, my uh, my fiance has been feeling under the weather, um, and so um, you know, just because of COVID stuff, I thought, you know. Oh yeah. Um, you know, just just to be safe. Um, I was I was going to just teach from home this week. Yeah. Right. They're giving us uh, five weeks this semester where we can, um, if if the class is is supposed to be fully in person, they're giving us five weeks where we can um, teach from home, um, and not and not get in trouble for it. And so this is week two of uh, oh, of, okay. of my time this semester. So. Oh, so the university kind of prepared for that just in case. Yeah, normally it's only three weeks. Um, there was there was a lot of backlash um, about it because they they weren't planning on increasing that for this semester, but the union fought pretty hard to uh, yeah. um, have them increase it. So and so they agreed for that. Oh, professor, I had a quick question on uh, Ansys. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't yet touched it. Uh, the software. Mm -hmm. But would you say it's kind of like similar to SolidWorks? It's, um, I mean, it's similar in the sense that you're, you're going to be working with 3D models. And so uh, SolidWorks and Ansys kind of um, interface together really well in that sense. But the, the goal of what you're getting from Ansys is, is very different. And so usually when you're, when you're going to use Ansys, you, you already have a completed CAD model. And so usually, you know, you're going to use SolidWorks to create the um, the CAD model or the 3D geometry, right? And then you're going to load that into um, Ansys to do to do analysis. Oh, it's you can import it straight from SolidWorks. Yeah, you have to save it as a certain format. Like you can't um, you can't use the default SolidWorks file format. Right. So you, you have to convert it to either a a dot step file STP or STEP or an IGS file. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm
Yep. Yep. I'm at home. Yeah. My, my fiance has been feeling under the weather, so um, I feel okay. But, you know, during these times, I think you can never be too safe, um, you know, and we have all the infrastructure set up for, for virtual teaching. And so I thought, you know, let's just be safe this week. Um, you know, I can teach my PJs this week. And so um, I decided to go for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate that.
All right, it's uh, one o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good afternoon, Professor. Hey, how's it going? Hey. Yeah, so as you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching from home uh, this week. And so, um, you know, just my, my fiance was feeling a little bit under the weather. And so, you know, just, just to be safe, I've decided to kind of just teach from home um, this week. So um, it's, it's, it's nice, you know, I, uh, even though it's, it's been nice going back to the office for most of this semester, it's, you know, I, I kind of forgotten a lot of the nice things about working from home too. So no commute, um, I can teach in my PJs, which is great. And, you know, um, just overall, just, it's just a lot more, more comfortable. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the plan for today is uh, we're going to continue our lecture notes on taxes and depreciation, okay? Uh, and so we have a bit more to go in the lecture notes, and so I, I want to make sure I finish that, um, mostly just for the homework. And so, um, you know, um, last week I did post homework four. Um, I know some of you have, have already started working on it, and you know, it's it's definitely a, it's definitely a long one. So it, it's not a it's not a short homework assignment. So um, I would definitely recommend you get started on that sooner rather than later. Um, I noticed that I, I did get a couple of, of questions uh, about the homework uh, through email, and so I, I, I did. I just want to say I, I did notice it, but uh, but I didn't get a chance to answer yet. So I'll probably do that after the uh, after the lecture. Okay, uh, but I did want to make sure we we at least finish up the taxes notes today um, because you do, you do need it to complete the the homework, especially the very last uh, very last problem. Okay, uh, and so if uh, if we do finish a little if we do finish that a little bit ahead of schedule. I'm going to start the next set of lecture notes, which is about replacement decisions, which, uh, you know, personally for me, I, I think is one of the most interesting parts of the class because it's, uh, um, I think it really quantifies something that, uh, that normally we don't think too, too hard about, at, le at least not from a quantitative uh, point of view. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so are there any questions I can answer before we, uh, we get started today? <clears throat> okay. Okay. All right, and so uh, let's go ahead and continue our lecture notes from taxes. And I, I and I want to start off with a uh, with kind of a, a topic that I, I kind of glossed over a little bit, just so that we can get to uh, some of the examples. Uh, but I want to talk about this concept of book value a little bit more. Okay. And so uh, remember, book value. This is the uh, this is a way that we can um, assess or keep track of the current value of our asset, right? Okay. Because remember, with depreciation, the whole idea is that you you buy this uh, you know this very large capital purchase. So whether it be a uh, you know a, piece, a heavy piece of equipment, or maybe it's a it's an automobile, or maybe it's a plane, and then the value of that um, of that um, asset is going to go down with time, right? And so the current value of that asset is known. That's that's what we call the book value. Okay. Um, and so I want to make a distinction. And so you know the book value. You know, this is, um, you know, um, exactly as, as I said here, it's, it's an expression of the value of an asset, but it's, it's, only, it's only an expression with respect to tax purposes, okay? Okay. And so what I mean by that is that you know the book value that's that's the one that's used to compute you know how much you should pay for taxes on a um, you know based based on your income and based on how much value is depreciated okay because um, typically you know um, and and this goes outside of outside of engineering too when people talk about selling something that they own they talk about something instead called market value and and market value is is different from book value and so I, I want to make sure that you guys have the distinction be between that okay. Because the market value is is also an expression of how, of how valuable an asset is, but that instead of being determined, um, you know, by a depreciation scheme, that's determined by just whatever the market trends are at the time. Okay.
Okay. Right. And so these these two are often not aligned. And so they're they're usually, you know, not gonna be too far from each other, but um, you know, there could be big differences depending on, on the state of the market, right? Because think about how we determine book value, right? So for, for book value, you know, we kind of decide beforehand, you know, at the very beginning of, of our calculation how this value, how the value of our asset is going to decrease with time, right? And so we're going to choose a scheme like straight line depreciation or, or declining balance depreciation. Um, and so kind of at the beginning, we kind of we kind of set the horizon for like the next five, 10 years of how much value our asset is going to lose per year. Okay. Uh, but that's that's totally independent from what the market does, right? Because you know, as we all know, you know, the market supply and demand it, it fluctuates with time, right? Um, and so, you know, if you have discrepancies between these two, then it kind of gives you um, some interesting situations in terms of, you know, how how you can get taxed um, if you decide to sell your asset early. Okay. Okay, and, and so I'm sure, you know, um, if, if you're, you know, some of you I know might be very familiar with this, or if not, you know, you've probably heard of it, uh, but cryptocurrencies took off a, a lot during the pandemic. And so the demand for computer parts, um, especially, you know, graphics cards, especially, you know, shot through the roof because people were using that to mine crypto. Um, and so, you know, uh, the graphics cards are, are one type of asset that, you know, we can consider be depreciable. But that's one thing where the market value for the um, for the for the uh, graphics cards is way higher than any kind of book value that they um, that they might have. Okay, just because the demand for them is is so so high, right? Um, and so when you have differences between them, you know, like I said here, you know, you can either get taxed on the difference between them, right? Um, or you might not get taxed at all, or you might have different tax rule depending on how how much it exceeds it. And so there are three, there are three situations that I, uh, that I want to go over, um, you know, that, that kind of illustrate this, uh, this idea. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, any questions on, uh, on this? Okay. All right. So let's go over the three, um, the three, three situations. Okay. And so situation one. Okay. And so in the first situation, um, this is a case when you sell an asset for higher than its book value, okay? Uh, and, uh, and what we call this in, in, in tax terms is called depreciation recapture. Okay. Uh, or another word you might hear um, um, uh, here for this being referred to is called ordinary gains. And so this happens when asset is sold for more than its book value. Okay. Uh, and so when this happens, the, the difference between um, the market value or the difference between what you sell it for versus the book value, um, you're going to get taxed on, on this because it counts as, as income, okay? Okay. And so visually, you know, it might look something like this, okay? So let's say that the book value is this bar right here. Okay. But then let's say that you sold it for, for this amount. Okay. And so the Y axis here is of course money.
Okay. And so this difference here, right, the difference between these two values here, this is called depreciation recapture. Okay. And this amount here is, is taxed. Okay. Uh, because it counts as, 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 you know, as income. Okay. And so you're basically selling it more than what the tax books say is, is the current uh, worth of that, um, of that asset. Okay. Okay. And so that's the first situation. And so the second situation is um, the opposite um, of that, which is called just a loss. And so for a loss, um, you basically sell the asset for something less than the book value. Okay. And so in these situations, the, uh, the difference between the, the market value and the book value is not taxed. Uh, and so let's say that, you know, just like before, the, the one on the right, this is going to be book value. And the right here, let's say this is market value here. Okay. And so this, and so this difference right here is characterized as the loss, okay? Um, and so this is this is not going to get this is not going to get taxed, okay. Uh, and in fact, you know what what you sell what you sold it for is is also not going to get taxed um, as well. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, any questions on uh, on this? Okay. All right. And so the third um, uh, the third situation that we have is called capital gains. And so capital gains are when you sell it, when you sell your asset for actually higher than the original cost. Okay. Uh, can I give an example of a loss? Sure. Um, and so, um, you know, ac actually, you know, my, my parents told me this story just uh, just last weekend that um, the first house that they bought was actually in Corona. Um, and so they and so um, they kind of purchased it at a very bad time. And so they purchased the house, um, you know, for a certain amount, um, right when kind of the, the housing prices were at a peak. And then literally, you know, a month after they bought the house, the housing market just crashed. And so, um, you know, they, they were kind of stuck there for a long time because they, uh, they couldn't, you know, if they sold the house uh, again, you know, they would lose, you know, a certain amount of, uh, of, of, of money just because the market's not there. And so um, the first few years of my life were, were actually in Corona before my family actually moved out to, to Cyprus. Um, and so uh, eventually my parents were able to sell it for, for not that much of a loss, but for just a little bit. And then they ended up renting out the house for, I don't know, six, seven years, um, you know, just, just to kind of make up that, 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 that money for the loss. But um, when, when they reported that loss, and so basically, you know, when they reported that loss for tax purposes, you know, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't taxed on, on anything, um, you know, any difference, but normally, you know, when you sell your house, you kind of sell it for, you know, a higher value because the house, you know, gains value over time and then you get taxed on, on that amount. Uh, but because my parents sold it at a loss, then, you know, they weren't taxed on, on that amount. Yeah. So a little bit of a solace, but you know, they, they did end up losing a fair amount of money from, from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, capital gains. And so, um, and so, you know, um, this is a case where the market value is, is so high that it, it exceeds both the book value and the original cost. Okay. And so the, uh, the situation looks something like this. Okay. 
And so let's say that we have this third column right here. And so let's say this is the original cost. Okay. And then let's say that some time has passed such that, you know, we, um, the book value is, is given by, by this. Okay. Um, but for some reason, you know, the demand for this asset is so high um, and, and it doesn't have to be this dramatic, but you know, I, I kind of just drew it just like that, okay? Where this is the market value, okay? And so you kind of have two, um, two degrees here of, of differences, right? And so the first degree of difference is, you know, this one, right? Um, and so, you know, this is the amount that you're, you're selling. This is, this is basically the same as, um, as situation one. So what I have in orange right here, and so in orange right here, this is depreciation recapture. Okay. Uh, and then the amount that you're selling it for over the original cost. And so this amount right here, right? Um, and so this is called capital gains. And this distinction is really important because uh, you know you're you're going to get taxed on both of these, um, or at least or at least you should get taxed on both of these. Uh, but this amount in blue right here, capital gains, um, this usually follows some different tax rules than than depreciation recapture. Okay. okay. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're going to get taxed on both, but, uh, um, but the, uh, um, but the amount, um, it might be different. Okay. All right. Question. So what's the difference between book value and the original cost? So the original cost is just whatever you bought the, the asset at. So day, you know, day zero, you know, you bought the, you bought the asset for a certain amount. That's the original cost, right? Uh, book value is an expression for how much that value is, how much that asset is worth in terms of tax purposes, right? And so depending on the depreciation scheme that you're choosing, you know, that the uh, the book value is gonna go down with time. And so it's, it's gonna start at the initial cost and then it's gonna decrease depending on what your depreciation scheme is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our question, so is a good example of this, like a cool old school car? Yeah, no, this is, a, that's probably, you know, um, one, of the, one of the prime examples of this. And so, you know, one, one, uh, one situation where you see capital gains a lot is for, um, what I like to call like collector's items. So like, like vintage cars, you know, cars that they're not making anymore, but have a lot of, um, you know, either historical or, uh, or aesthetic value, right? And so those are cases where you can sell for the uh, original, um, higher than the original cost, yeah. Um, collectible toys too, yeah, Funko Pops is, is, is a great example. Um, I actually know, I actually met someone um, within the last few months that, um, that has a fairly, very successful side hustle um, selling trading cards, actually. So like Pokemon cards, Yu-Gi-Oh cards, uh, Magic the Gathering cards. Um, and I met him at a dinner. He's like, yeah, I just bought a Rayquaza card for like ten for like um, $20,000. And I'm going to hold on to it for five years and resell it for $40,000. I was like, wow, <laughs> I wish I had that kind of money to, uh, to burn. Yeah. NFTs. Yeah. yeah NFTs is another, uh, is another, um, you know, example of this. Although, you know, I think, I think, you know, time still has to tell whether NFTs are, are actually going to be a good investment and you can actually make capital gains. Um, but, you know, the potential, the potential is there um, as well. Yeah. Um, but you'll, you'll rare, but, you know, kind of bringing this back to engineering, you'll, you'll very rarely see this in engineering, you know, especially working for an engineering companies. Because remember, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the items, a lot of the assets you're going to be doing this for are things like heavy machinery, um, it might be automobiles, planes, right? And so just naturally, just through use, um, these items, you know, they get their, um, they get kind of worn out and their parts get kind of rusty and, you know, and parts break. And so very rarely will you, you know, will you buy a pump as like, you know, as, as part of working for Southern California Edison and then resell it for something that's, you know, higher than that, unless, unless you're really ripping someone off. Uh, would capital gains sort of relate to scalpers? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And so scalpers are, um, you know, they they thrive on this stuff. And so they scalpers will buy stuff at at the original cost and then try to resell it for much higher, uh, much higher than they bought it for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scalpers are, uh, um, yeah, they make they make life difficult for <laughs> for the regular consumer. I'll I'll, I'll say that. Yeah. Um, okay. 
Uh, any questions on um, on capital um, on capital gains? Okay, all right. And so that was kind of the, a, a nice aside. And so you know, I, I did want to make sure I talk about this because you know, book value is different from market value. And so I, I want to make sure that we make that distinction because you know we're, we're we're doing all these tax calculations and we're kind of tracking the book value over time. And so I, I want I want you guys just to know that you know this book value that we have. It's, it's strictly just for tax purposes. And so that doesn't really mean that we could actually sell that asset for that amount. You know, that's just kind of the, the, the prediction or that's just kind of, um, you know, the account, uh, for accounting purposes, you know, how much the, 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 the asset is, is worth. But, you know, whether or not you can actually sell it for that amount or, you know, whether you can sell it for more, that depends on the market, okay? Okay, and so let's go back um, and, and, and start talking about our depreciation schemes again, right? And so we've, we've covered two of the four, right? And so I, I kind of promised you that there are four depreciation methods. And so the next method that we'll cover is called bonus depreciation. All right. <clears throat> And so bonus depreciation is, is, is a relatively new development, although at this point, you know, it, it's, it's used quite a bit. Um, I, think, I think it was developed sometime in the 90s or something like that, okay? Um, and it's kind of all based on, on this idea um, that the earlier that you depreciate um, the value of, of an asset, the better, uh, the more tax um, value that you get from it, okay? Or in other words, the way I'd like to describe it is the more aggressive your depreciation um, scheme is, or the more aggressive your depreciation schedule is, um, the more money you're going to you're going to have in the long run, because that gives you more money, you know, on hand immediately. Okay. Okay, and so we saw this a little bit on at, in the last example that we did, um, you know, at the end of class on Thursday, and so um, you know when we use a declining balance depreciation, which which had a much higher depreciation um, value up front, so in the earlier years, this en this ends up giving us a higher after tax present worth. Okay, and so generally, you know, um, from a, from the company's point of view, um, you know, if if they kind of want to maximize the amount of uh, um, a value that they get from the asset, or in other words, you know, reduce, you know, over time, reduce the amount of taxes that they pay, they want to uh, depreciate as much early on as, as possible, okay? All right, and so bonus depreciation is, uh, you know, and the reason it gets its name is that it, it lets you depreciate a flat percentage of your asset's value right up front. Okay. And so the way bonus depreciation works is that you define a percentage and then that percentage is at however much you, you take off on the first one. Okay. Uh, question. So, so if it's like 20, 50, 25, 50% is pretty aggressive. Yeah. Um, and so those are pretty aggressive, but you can even go up as, as high as up to hundred percent. And so um, I think in, in recent years, actually, you know, the bonus depreciation was allowed to be hundred percent. Okay. 
And so 100% is, is, uh, is the most aggressive that you can get, right? And so that basically says that, uh, you know, in the first year of operation, your, the value of your asset is going to go down by 100%, okay? Um, and so again, you know, that, that may not be true, right? And so if you're going to, if you're planning to use this asset for five years, you know, obviously it's, it's not going to break down after one year. Uh, but for tax purposes, you can, you can kind of appreciate all that away. Um, and then, you know, you're going to end up with a much higher after tax present worth, which I'll show you um, in the next amount. Okay. Um, and so the amount, and so the exact amount of bonus depreciation that you're allowed to do, uh, it changes year to year depending on uh, depending on the administration. Okay. Um, and so, um, you know, from the government's perspective, you know, a higher amount of bonus depreciation tends to stimulate business because it's uh, it tends to stimulate spending because then it, it encourages companies to spend uh, more money on upgrading their infrastructure um, because you know they then they have the assurance that they're not going to get taxed on it. Okay. All right, and so um, next we're going to do an example, and so it's it's going to be a, a redo of, of the examples that we did at the um, you know on the on last Thursday, but this time um, we're going to use a 100% bonus depreciation, and I'll show you you know what effect that has on the after tax present worth. Okay. Um, okay. So any questions on this before we uh, we jump into that example? Okay. All right, and so just to kind of refresh your memory, and so um, you know the idea with this example is, um, I think we're purchasing a, a truck for fifty thousand dollars, okay. Uh, this truck is expected to pull in twenty thousand dollars a year um, in revenue. Um, and at the end of, of the fifth year, we can sell it, we salvage it for another 10K. Okay. And so if we assume the standard 21% um, 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 for federal taxes, Uh, a tax rate of 21%. And also um, this time we're gonna use bonus depreciation. Okay. Um, let's compute the after tax present worth. And so just like, um, you know, just like we've done before, we're going to make a table out of this, okay? And so we're gonna have columns for the year, okay? And we're gonna have um, six rows. Okay, so one for year zero and then one, two, three, four, five, okay? Uh, we have a column for the before tax cash flow. We have another column for depreciation, okay? Okay, 
Then once we have those, we can compute, you know, how much of our income is, is going to get taxed, right? Okay. Then we can compute, you know, how much taxes we're actually paying. Okay. Then once we subtract the taxes from our revenue, we have our after tax cash flow. Okay. And then finally, in the last column, we have our book value. All right. And so in year zero, we simply just make the purchase of our um, uh, of our truck. And so we have a minus fifty thousand dollars. OK. Right. And then let me go ahead and, and insert all of the revenues that we have. And so those are all those are all the revenues. Since remember we have an extra ten thousand in year five because we're salvaging. Okay. All right. So now let's go ahead and fill in the depreciation. And so um, you know since we're um, doing a hundred percent bonus depreciation, this means that we're going to depreciate the entire cost of the fifty thousand right up front. And so um, you know um, we have uh, fifty thousand dollars in year one. Okay. And then after we depreciate that, you know, the book value after that is going to be zero, right? Because the um, the book value for our assets started at fifty thousand dollars, right? And so because we have depreciated that by hundred percent at the end of year one, then the book value is going to be zero after that, right? Because we've depreciated all of it, okay? And so since we've um, depreciated the entire cost of the of the asset up front, then it's going to be zero for everything else, okay? Right, so same thing for the book value, okay. All right. All right, and so now let's compute our taxable income. And so remember the way that we compute our taxable income is we take our, you know, our revenue, right? Um, and then we subtract our depreciation, right? Because depreciation, remember the way that we consider that is that's the cost, that's the cost that we're paying to run our business, right? And so in this case, we actually get a negative number, which I think is our first time uh, getting that, okay? Because if we do, uh, if we take the twenty thousand dollars that we made in year one, and we subtract the fifty thousand dollars for depreciation, we get a minus thirty thousand. Okay. And so we have negative taxes to pay. And so if we um, take twenty one percent of that minus thirty thousand, we get minus six thousand three hundred. Okay. Right. And so in cases like this, where you have, um, you're paying negative taxes, this counts as a tax credit. And so the government will actually either give you, you know, um, it'll give you a tax, this is, you know, this is, this is what people say when they get a tax return, right? Um, and so you could just get a check from the government, or it'll be like future credits for, you know, that you can use to pay for taxes later. But, but generally for businesses, they, they want to get the check, because, you know, um, once they get that tax credit, they can then use that to spend on other stuff, okay? And so in year one, you know, we actually, um, our after tax cash flow is actually higher than our before tax, right? And so before, ta before taxes, we made $20,000 in that first year. But if we add the $6,300 tax credit, then we get $26,300. Okay. Um, so, do so does that make sense about why? Um, you know, we we add um, you know we we add the tax credit onto our after tax cash flow in this in this case. Okay. All right. And so for every other year, um, you know, we don't have anything left to depreciate, and so we're gonna, we're going to get taxed on the entire amount of money that we made that year, right? And so for year two, since our depreciation is zero, then we're going to get taxed on the entire twenty thousand dollars. Okay. Right, and so that means we're going to pay forty-two hundred dollars in taxes. One extra zero there. Okay, and so after we pay our taxes in year two, we made fifteen thousand eight hundred. Okay, and then this is actually going to repeat um, for the next. Um, I'm counting the zeros. Okay, yeah, for the next couple of years, this is this is going to repeat. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and fill those in really quickly.
Okay. And then for the last year, because we, we made that extra $10,000 by selling, okay, then we're going to pay more taxes. Okay. Right. <clears throat> and so after we pay our taxes, you know, that's how much we make in the last year. Okay. And so um, for this problem, you know, we're interested in what's the after tax present worth. Okay. And so if we take the, the last column there, and so all of those cash flows, and then we take our initial cost, we can then compute our after tax present worth. Okay. And so just in the interest of time, I'm not going to write out all of the uh, all of the cash flow amounts and all of the conversion factors just because, you know, uh, we've done that so many times now. Okay. And so if we uh, run through those calculations, we have an after tax present worth of twenty four thousand three hundred forty eight point four six. Right. And so if you compare this, uh, if you compare this value to um, our after tax present worth from straight line depreciation. So let me go ahead and write that. Okay. From straight line depreciation, we got an after tax present worth of twenty one thousand one hundred seventy one twenty nine cents. And for declining balance, okay, so we'll call that DB, the after tax present worth that we got from this was $22,792.47. Okay. And so you can see with the with the bonus depreciation, we're doing significantly better in this case, right? And the reason being is because, you know, because of that huge tax credit that we got in year one, right? And so because we had, you know, this is kind of the ultimate, the ultimate aggressive depreciation strategy, right? And so this is, you know, we, we depreciate everything up front, okay? This gives us a lot of money that we have, you know, in the, in, in, you know, uh, maybe not present day year zero, but much sooner than, than the other ones, right? Um, and that's a huge benefit because this difference in, in present worths, you know, this represents, you know, an extra $2,000, $3,000 that we can have right now that we can spend on other stuff. We can either reinvest it um, or we can spend it on, um, you know, maybe another piece of equipment. Uh, DB just stands for declining balance. And so that's the, uh, that's the second depreciation method that we covered um, at the end of lecture on, on Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, so how did I get the after tax for row one again? And so for row um, one, um, I took the um, before tax cash flow, which was the twenty thousand dollars, and I added the tax credit that we got. And so, because our taxes was negative in that first year, then the amount of um, the after tax cash flow is the amount of revenue that we got plus the tax credit, which was six thousand three hundred. And so that's twenty six thousand three hundred. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so, from a business's perspective, you know, having an, an aggressive um, depreciation style like like this is 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 generally you know preferable, because this gives you you know much more money up front, either in the form of a you know in this case we straight up got a tax credit, okay, um, but in other cases it could mean that you pay either no taxes or very little taxes early on, and that money that you save can be spent on other stuff, right? Because remember, you know, money is always a lot more valuable when you have it. Um, now or, or, you know, in the near future versus, you know, much more in the future. And, you know, this and this depreciation scheme here encapsulates that, you know, perfectly. And so we depreciate everything up front. And so that gives us more money to use up front and then we can use it for, uh, for other stuff. Yeah. Uh, question, am I going to go over macros? Yes, that's going to be, that's going to be the very next one. And so macros is the fourth and final depreciation scheme. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to do that immediately after this. Um, any questions on uh, on bonus depreciation before we move on to to macros? Okay. Uh, and so you know one 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 downside that you have for bonus depreciation, and so you know from here it makes it look like it's great. Um, but you know if you decide to sell that asset early, and so let's say that you know we decide to sell it at year two, right? 
um, then we're going to get taxed on basically everything that we sell it for because our book value is zero, right? And so remember where we talked about, um, you know, the difference between market value and book value at the beginning of class today, right? And so with bonus appreciation, you know, you're, you're basically making a commitment that you're going to, you know, that you're going to use this piece of equipment for as long as, as long as you can, because if you decide to salvage it early or sell it early, you know, you're going to pay the taxes then, right? Whereas if you use kind of a more gentle depreciation scheme, you know, that kind of, that kind of buffers you for the amount of taxes that you might pay because you, you still have some book value in that sense. Yeah. Uh, but generally, you know, most companies, you know, engineering companies are, are not usually in the business of selling stuff early because, you know, they, they go through all the trouble and, and all the protocol to buy, you know, a big piece of equipment, you know, most of the time they're going to use it for as long as they, as long as they can. So they're not going to sell it to a competitor uh, early. Yeah. Okay. And so that's the third method for depreciation. Okay. And so the last method that we'll go over in this class is called MACRS, okay? And so that's actually an acronym, okay? And so, um, you know, the, the acronym stands for Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System. Okay. And so the acronym, you know, because, you know, that, that, that name is, is really hard to, uh, to say. And so people usually refer to it by its acronym. Okay. And so you can call it MACRS, which, which is what I do, or you call it MACRS, um, or you can do MACRS, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat. I think it's, uh, everyone kind of knows the same thing. Okay. And so this is a pretty new development. And so this was introduced, this whole system was introduced in the Tax Reform Act of 1986. Um, and this is a, um, you know, uh, a relatively simple and consistent way to determine depreciation of, of certain um, of certain assets. Okay. And so the and so the way uh, Mackers works is that it, it's uh, um, it, it kind of um, you know it kind of makes a few assumptions and you kind of have to do a, a little bit of extra um, stuff up front um, to determine um, you know how to use it. Okay, um, and so there's three the ba there's basically three tenets or three kind of um, characteristics of um, of using Mackers. Okay, and so number one, and so the first um, kind of the first um, you know rule to using to using macros is that um, you know whenever you have an asset, um, you have to assign it what's called a property class life. Okay. Um, and so depending on what type of um, device it is or what type of machine, it's, it's basically given a class, right? Um, and, so this, um, and so this property class, um, you know, determines basically from, from, from tax purposes, how long the, uh, how long the asset's going to, um, how long it's gonna last, okay? Okay. Uh, and so on the next page, you know, I'll give you kind of the, the six different classes that are, that are out there, you know, at, at least, you know, um, at least as of, you know, when I, when I wrote these lecture notes a few years ago, but, you know, these, I think these descriptions, they get updated, you know, pretty, pretty um, uh, relatively often because the uh, new technologies emerge all the time. Okay. 
All right, and so the second um, tenet or the second characteristic of Mackers um, is really just is really an assumption. And so what we assume is that the salvage value for these, um, you know, for these assets is going to be zero. Okay. All right. And so once you uh, once you assign the property class, um, then the the amount that you depreciate each year is um, basically um, determined by a percentage of the original cost. Okay. Okay. And then um, the way that we determine these percentages is that they're, um, they depend on whatever the class is. So, um, you know, um, the next two slides are basically going to be just a bunch of tables. Okay. And so, um, you know, a basically that you, all you have to do is just look up a table for what that percentage um, is for that year. Okay. All right. And so um, once you have these these two things, then it's, you know, um, performing this tax calculations is, is a little bit, um, you know, not so bad. All right. Any questions on this before we uh, we define the uh, all the property classes? Okay. All right, so let's uh, um, let's go ahead and define all the um, all the property classes for for Macris, Okay. All right, and so there's six of these. Okay, and the uh, and the property classes are are basically defined by how long the asset's going to last. Okay. All right, and so the first property class that we have is a three-year property, okay? And so those are properties that are assumed to last for three years, okay? Um, and the types of devices that, uh, that last for three years, at least according, at least according to the, uh, the tax people, um, are devices like food and beverage handling devices, Um, things like things in um, plastic manufacturing. Okay. And fabricated metal products. Okay. This is this is a very short list, and so there's uh, the real list is is much longer than this. Okay. Uh, but I just wanted to give you some some examples of, of certain types of products or certain types of devices that fit under this category. Okay. All right. And so if your product or if your asset falls into um, one of these categories, then in terms of macros, we, we classify it as a three year property. Okay. All right. And so next we have a five year property. And so five-year properties are things like automobiles and trucks. Okay. Uh, aircrafts um, count as a five-year property. Okay. Research equipment. Um, and computers. 
I'm going to try to limit it to basically two lines worth of, uh, of products for each one. Okay. All right. Seven year property. And so um, if your if your asset belongs to one of these categories, then they're classified as a seven year. Okay. And so there, these are things like office furniture. Um, things like fixtures. Okay. Uh, and the seven year property is, is, is kind of unique. And so for, um, um, for all devices or all assets that don't fit into any other categories, then they're, they're assigned a seven year property by default. And so the seven year property is kind of the uh, um, everything else or the miscellaneous category. All right, and so that's ten, uh, seven year. And so next is 10 year. Okay. Um, and so uh, 10 year properties are things like petroleum refining. Um, and also uh, water transfer equipment. Okay. All right. So there's two more. Um, number five. So we have these are 15 year properties. Okay. Uh, and so for 15 year properties, um, these are things like tele telephone distribution plants. Okay. Just in the interest of time, I, I do want to kind of move quickly. So for 20 year, um, some one example of this would be like um, any kind of municipal sewer equipment. Okay. All right. And so depending on the uh, on the type of um, type of um, asset that you have, you know, we assign it a property class. Okay? And then once you've assigned it as a property class, you can then, um, you know, you can then read the table on the next page to determine, you know, how the depreciation amounts will change per year. Um, okay, uh, any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right, so let's go over the um, let's go over the um, table amounts for um, or the percentage amounts for each of these um, classes, okay? Um, and I'm not going to write all of them just because it's uh, it's it's kind of a lot, but I do want to show you, you know, the difference between like a three year and a five year, um, and, I, and I'll show you seven years as well. Okay. All right. And so let's go ahead and make a column for year. Okay. We'll make a column for a three year property. Column for five year and make column for seven year. All right. Oh, sorry, starts at year one. Okay, so for the three year property, um, you know, the percentages are like the following, right? And so in year one, we have a 33.33%. Okay. okay. Year two, we have 44.45. Okay. 
Year three, we have 14.81. And year four, we have 7.41, okay. All right. And so what these numbers mean is that basically, uh, with, if you have a three-year property, then in year one of using that, uh, of that asset, then you're gonna depreciate a third or 33% of its, uh, of its cost in terms of depreciation, okay? And then in year two, you're gonna depreciate 44% of that, okay? Year three is gonna be 14.81, and year four is 7.41, okay? And so you might be asking, you know, if it's a three-year property, you know, why are we getting depreciation charges um, in the last year, right? Um, and why is the amount for year two greater than year one? And actually, you know, both of these questions are actually related to each other, okay? And so the reason, you know, the reason we have that is Mackers runs on this um, additional assumption called the half-year convention. Right. And so what that means is that, you know, we basically are gonna assume that our product or our asset is going to be put into uh, into service halfway through the first year. Okay. Okay. And so that first year's depreciation charge only represents kind of a half a year's worth of, of use, okay? Because uh, remember, you know, generally speaking, businesses want to depreciate more of their cost upfront, right? Um, and so ideally, you know, these the percentage amounts should start really high and then decrease downwards, you know, from, from there, okay? But because of this half year convention, then we only have basically a half a year's worth of depreciation in the, uh, in the first year. All right, so let me go ahead and fill in per the percentages for the five year, okay? And so it's gonna be 20.0, then we have 32, then 19.20, then 11.52, then 11.52, and in year six, we have 5.67 or 7.6, sorry. Okay. And then for the seven year property, this is and then 4.46, okay? All right, and so, um, you know, um, I know I know that, you know, this is all still a little bit abstract, but, you know, in the next, uh, on the next page, we're gonna do an example, um, which is gonna be redoing our example from before, but we're just, but we're gonna um, do that instead with Mackers instead of bonus depreciation, okay? And I think from the example, I think it'll be pretty clear, you know, um, how to actually use Mackers, okay? And so Mackers takes, takes a little bit of an extra setup just because you have to define the property class and you have to know these percentages. Um, but, you know, once you actually try to use it, it's, it's actually, um, you know, not that bad, okay? Uh, okay, so any questions on, on this before we, we jump into an example? All right, so let's go ahead and do um, redo our example for the fourth time, uh, but this time with the macros depreciation, okay? okay. All right, and so remember, in order to use Macker's depreciation, we have to define a property class for our asset, okay? And so if you recall from the, uh, from the previous example, you know, the, the asset that we're, that we're doing the calculations for is a truck, okay?
Okay. And so what this means is that you know we're um, our truck here is going to count as a five-year property class. Okay. And so what that means is that the depreciation schedule is the um, you know follows the follows the percentages on the on the previous page. Okay. All right. All right, and so just to, just to kind of make it clear, I'm gonna make the depreciation schedule separate from the tax table, okay? Okay, normally we, we would uh, put this all um, within the table, but I just wanna make it clear so that, you know, um, cause it can be a little bit hard to, um, to put all that in, okay? All right, and so if we read off the table from the previous page, we can um, write out the macros percentage amounts The only exception is going to be in year five, because um, even though the Macker's table goes up to year six, uh, we know from this problem that we're only going to use it for five years. And so on the very last year, we're going to take the amounts for year five and year six and just add them together. Okay. Right. And so year five here is going to have a little bit, a little bit something extra on top because we have to um, depreciate um, the amount from year six as well. Okay. All right, and so the way that we um, um, the way that we compute the depreciation amounts each year is that we're going to take our initial cost. Remember, our initial cost is fifty thousand. Okay, and then we're just going to simply multiply it by the percentage from that year, right? And so for the first year, we uh, we're going to we're going to depreciate 20 percent of that amount. Okay, and so that's going to be ten thousand. For the second year, we're going to depreciate 32%. And so this is going to be 16,000. Okay. In year three, we're depreciating 19.2%. Okay. And so we perform that multiplication, then we get 9,600. Okay. In year four, we're depreciating 11.52%. Um, and so we perform that calculation, we get 5,760, okay? And then last year, we're depreciating 11.52 plus uh, 5.76, okay? Okay, and so this gives us a depreciation amount of uh, 5,760 plus 2880. Okay. Right. And so under Macers, this is the, this is the depreciation schedule that we, um, and that we get. Okay. All right. And so, um, the next step that we're going to do is we're going to take these depreciation amounts and then put them into a tax table. Okay. Um, and then just like before, we're going to compute the after tax present words. Okay. Um, okay, uh, but before I do that, you know, I, I, I think one of the one question that I've got a lot on the homework is, you know, problem 4A. Problem 4A, I, I ask you just to compute the depreciation schedule, okay? And so when I say just compute the depreciation schedule, all I mean is that you should just do this, what I have boxed in red, okay? And so you'll, you'll notice from, you know, if you haven't gotten there yet, you'll notice from problem 4A that, um, you know, um, that I didn't give you any, um, um, any revenue, I didn't give you any, um, you know, salvage value or anything like that, because the only thing I want you to compute for 4A is just, just this. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's, that's kind of another reason I wanted to do it separate, just to kind of show you, you know, how you would do problem 4A. And so, you know, if the problem just asks you to, to compute the depreciation schedule, just do this, right? Um, so whether it be Mackers or straight line depreciation or bonus, um, or what you'll see later on a, a combination, you know, I, uh, when I said depreciation schedule, all I mean is the amount of depreciation each year, right? And so you don't have to factor it into the tax calculations at all. 
Okay, but for this problem, we, we are going to factor into tax calculations, okay? Okay, and so let's go ahead and make our same table, our same columns from before. Our question. Our question. So if it includes, oh yes, yes. So after after this, um, you know, I, I'm going to try to squeeze it in. But if you uh, if you'll notice on the very last problem of the of the assignment that um, I'm having you do um, two things at once, and so um, bonus and a another one. And so you know, we'll talk about you know, kind of very briefly. We'll talk about after this one, how do you combine different depreciation schemes in one? Yeah. Yeah. But let me go ahead and finish uh, finish up this one first, and then we'll we'll jump to that one. All right, and so let's go ahead and fill in our before tax cash flows, just like we've done before. Okay, so fifty thousand in year zero because that's where we're purchasing. Okay, and then twenty thousand. for each year, and then in year five, we have thirty thousand. Okay. Uh, the depreciation amounts we just computed, and so all we're going to do, I'm just going to drop these values into the table, okay? okay. And so for this last row right here, you don't have to keep it as a uh, as a sum. Uh, but my map map is closed right now and my calculator is out of battery. And so, and I'm not in the, I'm not in the mental space right now to do arithmetic on the spot. And so, you know, normally you would just perform that addition between those two, but you know, I'm, I'm just kind of too lazy right now. All right. And so remember, um, so now that we have all our depreciation charges, we can compute our taxable incomes, right? And so our taxable income is just the difference between our before tax cash flow and our depreciation. Okay, uh, and then once we have our taxable income, we multiply by the tax rate to get our taxes, right? And so unfortunately, you know, because these percentages aren't very uh, clean, we're gonna get numbers here that aren't particularly clean, right? And so, you know, this is usually the point where tax calculations get a little bit tedious. Uh, year four taxable income is 2,990.40. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Joshua. Yeah. So the uh, um, so someone in the chat put the uh, the the depreciation for the last year should be 8,640. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And then the after tax cash flow is just the difference between your before tax and your taxes. Okay. All right. And then because we're not depreciating all of it at once, you know, we have our, our we're going to have our book values here, you know, that are going to be non zero, right? And so our book value after year one is going to be 40,000 because we've just depreciated 10,000 off of that cost. Okay. Then it's going to be 24,000. Then it drops down to 14,400. Okay. Then uh, drops down to 8,640 and then zero. Okay. 
All right, and so if we if we take this uh, this column here for the after tax um, after tax cash values, um, then we can compute the after tax present worth um, from these calculations. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, any questions on this? I, I know it's kind of a lot to write down, so I'll, I'll give people a, a minute or so to uh, to do this. Year four taxable income. Oh, it's uh oh, it got a little bit scuffed there. And so it's 14,240. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody good? Okay, um, and so um, if we if we take the the um, the entries in the after tax column and we compute our after tax present worth, okay, uh, you'll notice here that it's it's quite messy, and so it, it'll be it's going to be hard to do like a uniform series on this because it's it's a different almost a different amount every time. Um, so it, it is a little bit tedious, but if you do compute that after tax present worth, um, then what you get is. Uh, what you get for this is 22,951.32, okay? Right. And so it's not, uh, it's not as much as the bonus depreciation. And so the bonus depreciation, you know, 100% bonus is, is always going to be the best thing. Um, but it does do better than the straight line method, and it does better than the uh, declining balance as well, right? And so Mackers is, is kind of a, uh, um, a system that, you know, um, if 100% if bonus depreciation is not available, and so let's say that the, uh, the government says that, you know, um, you can't do that right now, then you can use the Macker system. And this is kind of the way that you maximize the, uh, um, the after-tax present worth of, of your stuff, okay? Um, okay, uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, so the last thing I, I want to go over is um, is what you can do to combine bonus depreciation with some other schemes. Um, oh, question. So why did the year five depreciation have two mackers? And so the, the reason for that is because normally a five-year property um, has percentages that go up until year six, right? But because we're ending this, uh, this property after five years, then those last two ones get, get combined into one. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And so, um, you know, a lot of times what companies will want to do is they want to combine bonus depreciation with some of the uh, with some of the other methods. Um, because if bonus if 100% bonus depreciation is, is not available, then what they can do is they can um, put a um, however much bonus depreciation is, depreciation as they can, and then depreciate the rest of whatever is remaining using a different scheme. And so let me do just a very quick example, just because we're we're almost out of time. But I want to make sure that you you can you can at least get started on the on the homework, right? So let's say that we have a fifty thousand dollar truck, okay. And so let's say that we're going to depreciate this using a, a combined scheme. And so let's say that we're going to combine a forty percent bonus depreciation. And then the rest of the the rest of the um, amount is going to be depreciated with straight line. Okay. All right. And so the way these work is that the the first thing that you're going to compute is the bonus depreciation. Okay. okay. And so you're going to take forty percent of the of the fifty thousand. Okay. 
And so this is going to give you 20,000. Okay. And so this is $20,000 that you're going to depreciate in year one. Okay. Right. And so immediately after the bonus depreciation, you've taken off twenty thousand dollars worth of value from this uh, from this asset. Okay. Uh, and then after after you depreciate that twenty thousand, then you're gonna have thirty thousand dollars back. Okay. And then this thirty thousand dollars, you're gonna depreciate that with straight line. Okay. And so let's say that we have a straight line, um, you know, um, value for five years. Okay. And so this means that each year, years one, two, three, four, five, we're going to depreciate six thousand dollars per year. Okay. Um, and I know I know I'm over time, and I apologize, but let me but let me just kind of you know combine these together in, in one, right? And so if you write out the depreciation schedule for all five years. You know, it's going to look something like this. And so in year one, you're going to have $26,000 because you have the bonus depreciation plus the $6,000 from the straight line. Okay. And then each year after that, you're going to have $6,000 due to the straight line depreciation. Okay. Um, and so when you combine bonus depreciation with other methods, usually you're going to have a, a fairly front loaded um, first year. Okay. And then every year after that is going to be, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit less. Okay. All right. Um, and so, you know, hopefully that 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 kind of sets you up for how to do the last problem because the last problem I think is exactly this. And so the last problem is a bonus plus a straight line method. Okay. All right. Any final questions on this before we wrap up for uh, for today? Okay. All right, and so I, I, I did go a couple minutes over, so I, so I apologize for that, but you know, hopefully this last piece of information is helpful for you guys on the homework. So uh, have a great rest of your day, everybody. Um, you know, get, definitely get started on the homework if you haven't already, and I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you, Professor. Take care. You too. Uh, hey, Brennan. Let's hey, Professor. The, how's it going? Uh, it's all right. Uh, last week on Monday, I got into a car accident. Oh, shoot. And, uh, Are you okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm recovering. I can't really see out of one eye right now. Oh, dang. Oh, man. Yeah. I, I missed all last week because of it. Uh, I don't know what to, like, how to, like, recover. I'm there to try to talk to the department chair. Okay. Yeah.